this is the Education Committee in the Vermont House of Representatives, and we're continuing our conversation in COVID-19 response. And we have four superintendents here. Um, and I think we'll start with Lynn Coda from Franklin Northeast. And uh, we're interested in hearing how things are going. You know, what, what's, what's the, what are the updates? And, and always we'll ask all of you if there's anything that you see that we can do so Lynn, Coda, All right, thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak with you today. Today is the 18th day um, since Vermont schools, it was the 18th school day since Vermont schools were closed for in-person learning due to COVID-19. Normally 18 days doesn't feel like much, but in our current reality, it feels like it's been a very long time since we last had all of our students and staff members physically present in our schools. In the last 18 days, our school staff members and educators from around Vermont have accomplished extraordinary feats with very little lead time. Educators and administrators have problem solved solutions to extremely complex problems within tight timelines. I'm gonna give you some examples of things that have been happening in Franklin Northeast. Very similar things have been happening throughout Franklin and Grand Isle counties and the rest of Vermont. So in FNESU, our food service staff is serving meals to 1,512 children each day, resulting in more than 15,000 meals that are delivered each week out of our four production kitchens. Our numbers continue to rise, which is certainly a reflection of the needs within our community. Administrators, curriculum leaders, teacher leaders, technology specialists, and behavior specialists have collaborated remotely to develop and provide professional learning opportunities to teachers and staff in order to help them develop the necessary skills to navigate our current maintenance of learning phase and get ready for the continuation of learning phase that begins on Monday. Teachers, special educators, speech and language pathologists, counselors, and our behavior team have been designing both online remote learning opportunities and equitable hard copy learning resources for those students without internet access each week. They've been learning how to use new tools, persistently working to connect with students and families through a variety of means, maintaining contact logs, teaching logs, and serving as a hub for matching families with much needed services like childcare, internet, financial unemployment, mental health, and food services. At the same time, teachers have been designing the new learning opportunities that will begin on Monday. Some teachers have found creative ways to manage their own limited broadband access. I've seen and heard about examples of teachers driving to school parking lots to access Wi-Fi in order to send materials, connect with students and download work. In another case, I've heard about a teacher driving to an in-laws house to access better internet while sitting outside on the porch in order to social distance from loved ones while providing learning opportunities and making connections with students and families. Our work as educators is centered around students. Navigating this new reality absent the physical presence of our students is challenging. Not only do our educators miss our students, our students are also missing our educators. Our staff members have creatively found ways to show love and care to students by placing signs and messages in bus windows, having staff parades follow buses on meal delivery routes, launching video messages through social media, screencasts, phone calls, emails, and group digital meetings. Our staff members have begun learning how to sew face masks and are now also using 3D printers to make face shields for essential workers. We've partnered with the Child Development Division in order to match the childcare needs of local essential workers with the available childcare resources within our community. Our special educators, clinicians, counselors, OT, PT, SLP therapists, and nurses have all been learning how to offer teleservices with children who need that level of support. Special educators have been working to navigate the complexities of providing special education services remotely to students. They've collaborated with classroom teachers and parents to ensure that each student eligible for special education services has a distance learning services plan that focuses on reasonable, appropriate, essential skills in light of our circumstances to identify how educational progress will be maintained. Distance learning plans have been created with multiple options, individualized and in collaboration with families. Some options include offering consultation and parent training to families 
asynchronized opportunities in which videos with learning materials are sent home to be completed at family's discretion or direct instruction with video conferencing with staff. For those students who do not have internet available, learning materials are sent home and staff follow up to the best of their ability through phone calls to provide services. Some of the greatest challenges we faced have centered around the limited broadband accessibility for our students and staff members. We've worked hard to help families access some of the free internet options that have become available as a result of COVID-19. It's been challenging for our teachers to connect with students who don't have internet access and the amount of time and persistence needed for this is tremendous. Planning to provide equitable opportunities for these students is one of the greatest barriers to distance learning. This presents an equity issue for our learning community. We're struggling to make connections with some students. Not only do they have access, not only do they not have access to the internet, they also have limited phone access. I learned just yesterday that some families have run out of prepaid minutes on their phones and are unable to afford to buy more minutes until their benefits begin, which makes phone calls between students and teachers impossible. Another barrier is that we don't have enough devices for all of our students. We are able to provide devices to all of our students in grades three through 12 and those younger students who receive special ed services. Uh, we intend to purchase devices for the remaining students, but there are a long wait lists for those critical learning uh, tools. Some of the lessons we've learned during this time, uh, I think the most important is that communication is the key during a crisis like this. Communicating early and often has built trust within our community. We've, see, we've received a lot of positive feedback and appreciation for the work we've done to connect our families with resources, provide real-time updates and share plans for what's coming next. We've also learned that as a team, our best work comes from an all hands on deck approach. We've embraced a team leader method and collaborate and share the knowledge and resources we have available to us for the good of the whole. It is only because of this teamwork that we can manage the monumental amount of work that has come our way. We've come together to do great things in just 18 days, things we would have thought were unattainable a month ago. I'm blessed to lead an FNESU. It's a system nestled in the far Northwest corner of our state. I'm so proud of our staff who are working really hard to meet the needs of all of our students and families while balancing the needs of their own children at home, their limited internet access and the tremendous time pressure we find ourselves under. We've embraced the idea that flexibility and setting reasonable expectations for our students and families is incredibly important. Our staff has risen to the challenge and continue to inspire me on an everyday basis. Much of the work that's happening in the world of education isn't as visible as it is when school is in session. But make no mistake, our teachers, administrators, and staff are carrying a heavy load, working harder than ever and doing it with grace, compassion, and extreme dedication to our students. I'm reminded, I'm reminding them often to be careful about their own well-being because I know they're working harder than ever before. I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. And I do want to thank you all for your thoughtful leadership and service to Vermonters during this unprecedented time. Thank you. Wow. Peter, you have a question. I'm wondering if you, if you want to ask it now. I also thought that we could just take all, all four and then open to questions. Well, this, it's a somewhat um, Lynn Coda specific question. Go you, for it. I, I just, and you can make a very, this is, I don't mean this to be a leading or political question, but I'm just curious to know since you were one of the last districts merged, if being a newly merged district has been a help, a hindrance, or irrelevant through this. You're still muted, Lynn. I wondered if there would be an Act 46 question <laughs> today in some way. I actually think that um, surprisingly, our communities have really, through the Act 46 process, they really came together uh, as a result of, of navigating the challenges that we faced during that time. And I actually think it has been a help. I think that our, our communities have really progressed to a point where we're trying to think of the work that we're doing uh, as a whole. There's no, um, I don't see any evidence that people are, are really trying to be town centered. We're trying to be organization centered. So I think it, it has actually helped during this and, and it's definitely 
Uh, the other piece of this is just the free flow of resources between our schools has been incredibly evident and everybody is willing to do their part and help wherever they can. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. I, I have wondered what it would be like if people were trying to merge now. Um, so thank you very much. Um, the next is, sorry, my papers are, um, Kevin Durth from Maple Run School District. There. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. I pretty much would be saying the same thing Lynn said uh, so eloquently. So I'm not going to repeat myself on on what she was saying. I think I, what I'll try to do is highlight some of the things that she mentioned. Great. Uh, as well as something Peter mentioned, which I think is probably very important. The what Lynn's district and my district are very much alike. Um, she, she's just northeast of me. And our district is made up of Fairfield, St. Albans City, St. Albans Town, which also includes uh, BFA St. Albans and our tech center, Northwest Tech Center. So it's about 2,700 students, pre-K 12. And maybe one of the one of the differences between our districts is, is we were one of the first to merge. And I would, to, to answer Peter's question from that perspective, uh, I'm, not a, I'm not sure how we would have done this or done this as effectively as we, we're moving forward now if we hadn't been a merged district. We, uh, we're four years into this now. We, rarely think of ourselves as Fairfield or St. Albans City or, or St. Albans Town. And if you know this area at all, uh, when people don't, don't start mentioning St. Albans Town and St. Albans City in two different sentences, that's a good thing. They're just, they, they're thinking alike. We are truly consolidated in all ways. And I think that is, it's helped the communication along the way. It's allowed us effectively to get to our, our kids easier and to do be consistent throughout the, the district as we move forward. So um, thank God for 46 as far as, as, far as I'm concerned. Um, as I said, just to reinforce some of the things uh, Lynn said, we are a slightly larger district. We're, we're serving about a thousand meals a day and uh, that's really a highlight. I think what I've heard around the state, but certainly in our area too, the, the people really appreciate this. Our students appreciate this. It's great that we've been able to do it. I publicly want to, we contract our food out with the Abbey. The public, we want to congratulate them for that. They are doing phenomenal, phenomenal work. And, and everyone, is getting, everyone is getting fed and that's increasing. Uh, continually throughout. Our teachers are also working extremely hard to the point that I'm a little worried of them, about them. The, um, they're doing things that they haven't totally been educated on at times. Everybody's in a different place relative to technology, and yet they're working extremely hard on this, and, uh, and, it, and it shows. Internet access is one of our biggest challenges. And I'm hoping if anything comes out of this crisis, it is the strong, strong need for good internet access throughout our state. It's imperative, it is, we're seeing it. The issues around equity uh, alone make this very, very difficult. We've worked hard to make sure whether they have access or not, that students will have some sort of access, but a lot of cases what we're having to do is bus packets of paper out to the students because they have no other way of, uh, of obtaining it. And we're still learning of ways of them getting it back to us safely. So 
those are just huge issues that I'm, I'm hoping we can, we can uh, deal with as a state as we go along. Another issue that is a challenge is around social and emotional learning. While we are worried, and as we should be, as we're going into continuous learning, we never can forget, and the, our district has really made it a priority, that we can't forget that our students are cooped up in a house right now, not seeing people, and we are worried about the social and emotional health. So we're working on this as much as we can. Our teachers are, are, are talking to families about how often they would like uh, teachers to call. So many cases, teachers are calling every day to talk individually with students, make sure they're doing okay. And uh, while that may not be academic in, in uh, some ways, it's, it's crucial that we know that they're doing okay throughout. One thing that really wasn't mentioned is, is special education. And I wish I had an answer for that right now, but I don't believe anybody does. We're doing the best we can and we're, we're waiting for guidance and we're obtaining guidance from the state. We continue need to, 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 to work towards that because some of the issues are just very, very challenging when you're doing things online with our special ed. Uh, but we are getting that guidance from the state. And I, I'm, I, every day we're feeling a little bit more comfortable as we move, uh, move through that. Um, I think the, the last two things I would mention, and, and in some ways I've already talked about it for challenges is, and I believe it's the same thing that every one of you on this call is, is, is dealing with, is just managing the anxiety level within our school district and keeping it calm, low key. We will get through this. It's a learning experience. I truly believe we're going to get stronger out of this. We're going to, teachers are going to be learning skills. They haven't had the opportunity to learn, to learn in some cases. In fact, one person I talked to today, a parent looked at me and said, you know, if you could only get this internet access taken care of, we could probably never have to have a snow day again in our lives because we could just do it technologically because you've got everything down now. And you know, he's, he's right if, if, uh, if we could make this work. And the last thing is just communications. We have found as our, in our district, as Lynn had mentioned, the more we can communicate out, and I think it's bigger than that. Um, you asked how you could support us. I think we as superintendents need that communication uh, from the state level down to us so that we can give that communication uh, throughout and give it on a timely basis because we are managing such high anxiety levels. And I believe it's getting better. However, I have to be honest and say, when the superintendents learn at six at night on the news that school's being closed for the rest of the year, it's not helpful. We heard that. And, uh, and I understand everybody's going this, through the same thing we are, but the more we can just help make sure that the, the whole level from, from, from governor down to, uh, to community is done, is well communicated, I think it would help. But we're getting through it and uh, as I say, I think we'll be stronger as we get out of this. Thank you. I'm gonna move on to the next one and, and I've already got some questions going, but we'll ask them of all of you. Um, Zach McLaughlin from Springfield. Well, I'd like to uh, thank all of you for the opportunity to uh, get your ear for a little bit here. Uh, I think Lynn and Kevin did a excellent job of uh, framing uh, what we're, you know, what we're doing, uh, what it looks like on the ground. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I will not repeat uh, a lot of what you heard uh, from them. I will tell you that I think one of the, I think one of the key things for, for this committee to know is uh, the careful balancing act we're trying to do with families around the amount of academic work we're asking people to do at this point. 
Um, and in terms of communication, I think one of the things I wanna make sure is really clear uh, at the state level is what is the expectation for the amount of, of new learning that will be occurring? Because on a regional basis, I know that we have a lot of conversations about families who are saying, this is too much right now. You're asking too much of us. Uh, we're not in a position to do some of the things that you wanna do. Well, we final, simultaneously are, are um, sympathetic to that, but also feeling the, the, the pressure to respond to what, what the expectation is of us at the state level. So uh, we're all doing balancing acts in that regard. And I, but I think universally what I'm hearing amongst districts is, is um, you know, take care of the people in your community first. And that is through the food, the opportunities around food that we're doing, but also around design that our number one goal first and foremost is, the, um, is maintaining kind of appropriate stress levels of our staffs and families in a period of crisis. So, um, so we're trying to do our best. And, and I think what's, one of the things that would be helpful is in the in communication that comes out at the state level, um, that expectations around what type of learning is going to be occurring between now and June are not uh, put at a level that's not attainable for ourselves or for our families. So I think that's something I want to uh, keep an eye on. Uh, the uh, I also say that there's an intense amount of collaboration happening among superintendents around the state right now. Um, we uh, we are a lot, there's a lot of small districts in our state, but you have uh, leaders from across um, across the state collaborating together uh, in a variety of different ways. Uh, that is in formalized ways through the the superintendents association uh, trustees group uh, doing a lot of work to um, to uh, to be a conduit uh, with the agency. Uh, and with the governor's office around things that we think are uh, necessary. Uh, that, that's been a lot of uh, late nights and weekend work um, to, uh, to pull that stuff off. Um, we, I will also echo in terms of things that you can be thinking about, I think Kevin and Lynn both talk, spoke about broadband. That's not something you're gonna fix in the short run, but that is clearly, it's becoming a, you know, it's a civil rights issue in a lot of ways that we have whole portions of our communities who are unable to uh, access um, what we're trying to provide at the moment. Uh, and, um, and unfortunately it's, it's going to, um, it's, it's only gonna magnify existing equity issues uh, within our state. And so that's a real, um, that's a real concern for me. Um, we haven't talked about the, the situation with the Ed Fund uh, and what uh, what is what in the mid the midterm for us as we're starting to transition out of our initial our initial response to closure, uh, we're all very cognizant of the fact that we don't know what our ability to even operate is going to look like next year. Uh, and so I have real concerns about our ability to do any type of planning about the return to school and what that will look like. Uh, and in my case, I'm, I'm one of the 18 uh, districts who do not have a, a don't have an operating budget for next year that has been agreed to uh, by my voters. And I don't know when I'm going to be able to do that. Uh, and I have a lot of planning that needs to occur in a very short time about what it's going to look like when we return. And right now, I'm not really able to do that planning. I'm also not able to do some of the hiring that I need to do um, as a result of that. So those are that is the uh, in the short run, and I know there is no, there are no easy answers to that to that question or that concern, uh, but um, that is creating a lot of additional stress. I'm sure it is for you as well um, on the field. Uh, and I don't think there's layers of people in our organizations who are not aware of the of the crunch that is going to come through the Ed Fund, but they're starting to become aware. And I worry about the impact that's going to have on all these people that are that are doing this amazing work. Uh, the last, uh, and, then the, and then the last piece, I would, I would go back to the equity um, piece once again. Kevin, Kevin mentioned that special education is a, is a real challenge at the moment to do with uh, authenticity. Uh, and, um, and I worry about, again, the, the least fortunate among, uh, among us, those with the most needs uh, being left behind in this period. So as we move ahead with a lot of the, the remote learning that we're talking about, uh, we're less equipped to deal with some of those students who have um, who have some special needs that are really hard 
to deal with at a distance. So I think that's the other thing to keep an eye on. Um, some of the things that you guys can do in terms of helping helping things for us, some of it is whatever regulation can be cleared uh, for us to have flexibility in the short run uh, to do the work would be greatly appreciated. Uh, and then whatever can happen to, to give us some, uh, some medium term clarity on uh, FY21 uh, is crucial. So thank you. Thank you very much, um, Zach. Meg Powden from Two Rivers. Thank you. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. It's, it's great to see you. Thank you so much for having us um, come and testify this afternoon. Uh, I really appreciate your interest in our work and uh, what we've been doing and uh, what our challenges are. I've been, recently I've been thinking uh, what a monumental endeavor we've we've been in, involved in and um, so I think our colleagues my colleagues have done a great job I'll, I'll, as Zach said I'll try not and Kevin I'll try not to repeat um, but I'll give you an overview two rivers supervisory union um, has two districts uh, we have six towns four four towns in the Green Mountain district two towns in uh, the Ludlow Mount Holly district and we have six schools, um, two middle, uh, high, uh, middle schools and high schools at two different buildings, and then four elementary schools. Uh, unfortunately, one of our, our schools, Black River High School, our Black River High School Middle School is closing at the end of the year. So the fact that we're out of school is impacted even greatly by those, more greatly by those students that they won't be able to be in their schools to school to end the year at the close of the year. So um, I'll just give you some overview of kind of how I've been thinking about the work, um, my orientation to this work. Uh, when it were our schools first closed, I started thinking about how, um, as the superintendent of Two Rivers, how I can lead our supervisory union through this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So I uh, borrowed Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And, uh, and I, I think about, you know, first and foremost, we need to take care of our needs so we can be available to educate and feed our students. So I've been very consistent in, in saying that to our employees that number one, you gotta take care of yourself to take care of your families and then be ready to work. Um, and I'm just so proud of how our employees have just stepped up and all of a sudden taken on all sorts of different work that they were never trained to do and um, have jumped right in. And, and our, our teachers are now um, distance teachers. They're providing an education online, which many of them never intended to do. and. Uh, and uh, we have paraeducators doing a lot of different work as well. We have, because of the, the way this um, COVID-19 can be spread, we have many protocols that we're using to keep people safe when and if they have to come into our buildings. And, um, you know, we've just had to think differently, think differently about our work and think very differently about our work. And, um, try to do our best to fulfill our mission to educate our students um, in, a, in this new work environment. Um, our teachers, we've asked a lot of them. As I mentioned, they are now um, teachers of online learning or distance learning. Uh, also, many of them were never familiar with the Zoom platform. So all of a sudden they had to become familiar with a new platform and, and how to deliver uh, instruction through that platform. Um, we've had all sorts of um, categories of employees that are, are doing different work and, um, you know, our school nurses, we look to them to give us advice um, and to help us um, determine how we should be working and how we should, you know, just one example, how we should allow service providers to come into our, our um, schools because we have on maintain, ongoing maintenance issues that need to happen. Um, as far as uh, special services, that uh, is, it, you know, one of the challenges also, we 
Our special educators and paraeducators have worked to provide services through the Zoom platform, even our OTs and um, occupational therapists and physical therapists. Um, and I think it's a credit to everyone, really. It's, 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 a, it's a whole hands-on deck effort here, not only our employees, but our families and our students. You know, we're all working together to, to make this work as, to the best of our abilities. And a uh, couple of things that I wanna let you know that are um, challenges for us. We have a critical situation at the Mount Holly School. We have fluctuating PFAS um, levels in our water system. And we had been working with, um, or our principal mainly, mainly Craig Hutpater, had been working with um, several entities to try to remedy the situation and um, it's stalled now. And, you know, our students, we had to truck in bottled water and they were accessing bottled water for several weeks. And, you know, to, to make sure that they can all get back to school in August, um, we just, we need help. We need help resolving that situation, learning, figuring out what we need to do to resolve that situation. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, connectivity is a challenge when uh, we put out a survey in the initial time um, of this school closure. Um, we had 37 households that reported to us that they didn't have any internet connection or if they did have internet connection, it was unreliable. Uh, fortunately with our director of technology, Lauren Baker and um, VTEL as our partner, we have um, brought that down to six households. And um, we are, um, we've ordered hotspots uh, for the households that still are not connected. Um, we're not sure they're gonna work. We're hopeful they're gonna work. However, um, you know, the different types that we've tried to order have been back ordered. And, um, you know, we'll, We'll continue to hope that they get here soon, certainly, so we can get everyone connected, but that is a, a challenge. Providing childcare or attempting to provide childcare was a, a, a huge challenge. Um, and we were hopeful that we would be able to have two sites for childcare. As uh, time passed, we were unable to provide that for the children of our essential workers. However, um, we have been working with those um, parents who are essential personnel to make sure their children have care. And uh, actually Zach recently told me there was an opening, a couple openings in uh, Springfield. So that was very helpful. And uh, an another concern um, that was recently brought forward by a board member who happens to also have, you know, not only his children being educated, but his, his wife is trying to provide an education to the students at, at her school. Um, just expressing concern about privacy. Initially, I thought he was talking about the platform because, you know, we have been assured, you know, and there, there have been recent uh, defaults that have been added to, to protect the privacy of our students and our teachers. Um, but more it was about the intrusive nature of us coming into their home, I think. And I think we, we need to be mindful of that. Um, and we try to be mindful of that. But, you know, it's just something for us to continue to be aware of. Um, another challenge or concern that we're not clear about yet is um, we have some employees who are not working for whatever personal reason that might be given the pandemic we're in. And so um, they've, um, one especially has asked us, should I, you know, claim unemployment? And, you know, initially our thought is no, we're paying you. However, you know, a question for us is, do we ask these employees or can we ask these employees um, to go on furlough and request unemployment? Um, or file for unemployment claim. Um, so that's a question we have. And um, I would like to just put a shout out to our food service program. Um, as 
my colleagues have said we continue to provide that on a daily basis. And also um, we will be providing it when we're on vacation next week. So um, these are our bus drivers, our food servants personnel and our paraeducators who um, deliver the food and, and are there at the schools for pickups as well. Um, they're gonna be working our, during our break. So I just wanted to give them a shout out. Um, so, you know, in closing, I just wanna say how fortunate I feel to work with such a stellar group of employees. We, we have an awesome team and, and we're doing great work. And I'm so grateful for the work that they're doing, um, that we're doing together for our students. And um, I, would, I do have an ask, um, and I know we're all working hard and we have a lot on our plates. Um, however, I'd like our, our essential workers to be recognized by this legislative body. Um, and I'm wondering if you could work with your uh, Senate colleagues and put together some sort of procl proclamation to recognize um, the efforts they have put into uh, this monumental endeavor. And that would be very appreciative, appreciated. So thank you. Kate, you're, you've been muted. Still muted. No. Oh. There we oh. go. Yeah, sorry. Um, in terms of, of technology, what what options have come forward that you didn't have before? What are the, what are the things? And where is it coming from? I've heard about some new hotspots. Were the did, were those things that were were given to you, or you sought them out? Or I, I'm just interested in in progress in the area of technology. Uh, so we work with the Educational Network of America, and so we try to order what um, they have called kajits. Um, however, that would provide um, hopefully some connectivity for our families. Unfortunately, those are um, on back order and they aren't available to us any longer. So um, our director of technology has been searching about where she can purchase um, some hotspots. I think she really recently went on Digital Wish. I, I'm not sure if that's the exact term, if that's where she went, but she's been shopping and um, we're, we're waiting on those 10 hotspots to come in. We've are also- shared with families the hotspots throughout the state in case they want to come to our schools or you know go somewhere else are are you getting help from the state on that uh in no. Any way? No. no okay um caleb elder and then peter conlon the question Thank you very much um i guess this is a question for zach uh you had mentioned that there were some real barriers that you foresaw in in being able to reopen schools in person when that time comes. And I I, uh, I, I was just wondering if you might elaborate just a little on, on just a, a couple specific examples of what some of those um, obstacles will be. Um, and maybe I, uh, I didn't do the best job of articulating. So for me, I think the kids are going to come back. Our, um, our kind of curriculum maps as to what we think the progressions of, of where kids are going to be are going to be are going to be all out of alignment. We're going to have a ton of like lifting to try to figure out, OK, so this this student, um, you know, get a portion of some some education during the fourth quarter of the year but they're in a variety of different places based on their accessibility to, uh, to the internet, to how much that we're, um, we're able to um, ask them to do effectively over that period of time. So when we come back, let, let's, let's keep the fingers crossed and say we're, we're back in the fall and everything's wonderful. Uh, if it is, it's still gonna be this uh, unbelievable lift over the course of the summer and into the fall to try to realign, because all the, all the things that we have set up 
in terms of our cur curricular progression is going to be all screwy. In addition to that, we're going to have a whole bunch of kids who have gone, gone through a, a, a really traumatic event. Uh, and so now we're going to have social emotional flare ups that we, you know, that would be more than what we would typically see. So all in the realm of all, all that extra work we need to do simultaneously, I don't know, I can't, I can't hire people right now uh, because I don't know whether or not I'm going to have a budget. Uh, and so those two things happening at the same time uh, scare me about my ability to do everything people are going to need me to do come the fall assuming the fall is when we're back in action. Peter Conlon. Well, thank you for the clarification. Uh, thanks, I don't really have uh, anybody this is directed to, but uh, maybe Kevin, you could uh, address this. Ha have all of the um, necessary protocols been worked out for remote teaching online in terms of student safety and, you know, just I know that there were a lot of issues with uh, FERPA as well, but I was thinking more about protocols for the teacher student relationship and making sure it's being you know monitored appropriately and, and all of that would like to take that <laughs> uh, uh, I'll take it uh, yes for the most part we're working on that it's not perfect yet because we're still learning what those protocols are and what's necessary in this type of environment. But for instance, we're ensuring now that there's two people in, in a uh, teaching together, usually a pair and a, and a teacher. So um, it's just not one person in the room and, and it would be like having a door closed with another student. So we're doing things like that where we've learned, we've been continuing to learn around Zoom and the the strengths and its weaknesses. And we're trying to put protocols in place around that with the waiting rooms, things like that, just to make sure, and this is also for our school board, to make sure those things are handled. So we are doing it. I don't think we're completely there yet, but we're continuing to research it and, and do what we can with that. Kathleen James. Yeah, um, thanks. It might be that this question is more appropriate later in the conversation. I'm not sure if this would be, uh, you know, more for Jay or, um, but I, on behalf of a couple of constituents, um, the question that I am hoping to learn a little bit more about is um, food service workers. And this is really kind of following along on one of Meg's uh, comments. Um, what, I, what I am hearing is that in some cases, um, Food service workers, we all know they've been deemed essential workers um, and, and they seem to not have a choice. So, um, I, you know, I'm wondering if there's any serious conversation about offering them hazard pay or whether there will be some flexibility in being able, you know, in schools being able to furlough those food service workers for whom staying on the job is really not appropriate. Maybe they're older or maybe they're at higher risk or even in some cases, maybe this is causing levels of anxiety for them that is becoming kind of a mental health thing. So it's just a concern I have. I, I'm not sure who's best to answer it. Maybe this is just something for the AOE or the Scott administration, but it's very much on my mind and I, I've heard it from a couple different folks. So I'm just gonna toss it out there. Thanks. So you, you mentioned my name, so I'll just respond real quick and superintendents can feel free to chip in. Uh, this is Jay Nichols for the record. Vermont Principals Association. So Kathleen and others, uh, it's done differently in different schools. There are there are places where I know for a fact that uh, food service workers are in a vulnerable population and have been told not to come in. They might be helping with playing the menu or something like that from their home, and it might be other support staff. In fact, my wife goes to the school two mornings a week in Berkshire, where Lynn's a superintendent, and helps make lunches because she's not in that risk group. Um, so I know that different schools are handling it this different ways, but I don't believe anybody who's in that vulnerable population has been forced to work to my knowledge and superintendents can certainly chime into that. Yeah, I'll add to that. Um, certainly uh, this, um, during this time, we've only asked workers to, um, fulfill job responsibilities if they can. Um, no one's been forced. Um, you know, we, as, as Jay's mentioned, we do have some 
some of our employees who are in those vulnerable um, populations um, or vulnerable categories. So, um, and we do have, um, you know, specifically, uh, we're, we're very mindful of the food service workers and the paraeducators, um, all of our support staff um, and what, what we're asking of them. And, and any employee can always say no. That's great, thank you so much. Serena, Austin. Thank you. Um, first of all, I just wanna recognize the work that you all are doing. And just every time we talk to any school teacher or superintendent, it, it, it's just amazing at how quickly you brought things up to speed for delivering education to Vermont's children. I guess I was wondering if there's any kind of thinking about maybe doing a questionnaire or survey for parents, you know, just because it was probably the first time that we've asked parents to do this and not, you know, just to get some feedback from them in terms of what worked, you know, what was difficult, was it too much work, was it too little work? And I'm sure you'll get something in the middle, um, but just to, again, use them as a, information point as to um, how this worked for them and how it could be improved, you know, if this should happen again. I don't mind speaking to that. Um, we, we definitely have been attending to that and that's something on our radar um, to, we're starting to draft it now to send out to families because it's, it's always about improving the practice, right? So, None of us had any experience preparing to shift into a mode like this. So that real time feedback that we get from the field will definitely help us to improve. Uh, we have sent out other surveys, um, but not specific to how the learning piece is going. And I think that as we shift into that continuation phase of the learning period, it will be really important to get real time feedback from both students and from parents. If, if I could also add to that, we do have a survey going out on May 1st um, for that very purpose. Um, and the reason we, I've chosen that date is because that'll be a, for us a full two weeks of implementing our continuity of learning plan. And we borrowed it as educators do from Franklin Northwest or, or we haven't completed it yet, but we uh, Franklin Northwest Supervisory Union has put one together. Meg, can I just ask you also, how many students do you have in your, in your district? Uh, we have about a thousand, a little over a thousand. Thank um, you. <clears throat> if you, if you, your question's been answered, can you put your little blue hands down <laughs> the screen? Um, we are going to be speaking, we're going to be looking into mental health um, for our students um, next week. We're going to be inviting some people in from the designated agencies considering um, Act 264 responsibilities for our children who are on coordinated service plans. Are you, are your folks or your teachers working directly with the designated agencies? How are they showing up uh, for your students who had had emotional behavioral uh, variety of challenges that were picked up by the designated agencies. Anybody? <laughs> I, I'll just say, and, and this might not be true for everybody, um, but uh, this is a gap right now in where I am. Uh, and that's not a criticism of those agencies. Um, we're, as we hustle to get up the, the core parts of what the governor set out for us, um, some, of the, some of this connective work has been, has been a little bit behind. And I don't know what I'll, I'll be interested to see the ability of those of those agencies to um, to assist in those ways once we get going. But I would say that that is that is not something that's fully emotional in my situation. What about others? Um, just to add to what Zach's saying, I, I would say it's similar for us. Uh, we rely on our um, guidance directors, school counselors, and school-based clinicians. Um, they've been meeting weekly they've done they've made sure to connect with our most vulnerable students um, right at the beginning uh, they continue to provide services uh, they put together a web page for um, uh, us as educators and also for our families so um, those are the folks we've been uh, relying on 
I would add that some of the services that we uh, typically have access to during the school year, we, we still are having some access to. There are others that um, we're still trying to navigate. Like Zach said, they're, they're ramping up what it is they're gonna be able to offer. Um, and, and we're navigating how that fits with what we're offering with kid, for two kids and families as well. I think the other piece of this is that families are struggling with some of the um, things that we typically struggle with in schools in terms of, of expectations around students who are resistant to doing work. So I think that we have mental health staff on our, um, in, our, in our organization that are reaching out to families and trying to provide some of that social emotional learning support for them because they, they don't typically have to ask their kids to do the kinds of things that they're having to ask them to do now. So providing and pushing resources out to families, um, not just to the students is really important during this time. And I would add, we've increased our, our own capacity in our school district around mental health uh, for several years. So we have, we have capacity to do some of this, but Lynn and I, and the rest of the Franklin Grand Isle superintendents are working directly with uh, our agency up there and communicating on a regular basis, trying to get more help as we go along, which has been tough because the agency up there has recently laid off over a hundred employees. So they're there, challenged also. Are there questions that we should ask them when they're in? If you think of them, yeah. we have some questions that 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 we're planning to ask. Um, I'm not sure what the question would be at your level yet, but we're still navigating that. I'm thinking just being clear about what services they provide or can provide us would be would be helpful. Um, I heard there was a request for flexibility. Can you? Um, tell me what kind of flexibility you're looking for. I'm not sure who that was. Yeah, I, I mean, I, some of, some of this has come has already come. Uh, it's not connected with programs from you guys. It tends to be federal programs, whether it's around food, it's uh, deadlines around title title money, title spending. Um, but whatever ability we have at the state level to give us as wide a berth as we can to try. Uh, I, I saw someone tweet this and I thought it was a great, great way to describe it. We're trying to like Apollo 13, our education system. Uh, and, um, and so as we're, we're doing that work, we're being as creative as we can be. Uh, but we run up against regulatory, you know, stuff that is created in a non-global pandemic environment uh, when we would all be going to schools. So for an example, again, you don't control this one, but we're trying to figure out how to deal with um, Meg missing privacy in a different way, but how are we dealing with FERPA in relation to the recording of, of class um, interactions uh, where we have, we wanna offer kids the opportunity to synchronously be present for a class and be part of a class dialogue, but then have other students who may need to asynchronously access that material. If we record that, there's certain issues with FERPA around our ability to do that stuff. Same thing with uh, Kevin talked about having one-to-one -one service with kids. And as a former high school teacher, I would never do a tutoring session after school without my door open so colleagues could, could be aware of uh, what was happening in my space. And now we wanna record those one-to-one -one sessions both for the sake of the student as well as for the sake of the staff member. Again, we're having questions about, well, what's our ability to do that within the existing regulatory framework? Now, those are all federal issues. But whatever stuff you guys have around dates, timelines, et cetera, that are related to state level, uh, state level stuff, the more um, flexibility you can give us in this environment uh, over the short run would be greatly appreciated. We have pretty um, direct access with the Superintendents Association. So that, that, that you can be sending things uh, to Jeff Francis um, and he can organize that and come to us. That would be, that would be great. We're standing by uh, waiting to hear from, from you as to things that you think that we can do. I know some of the dates and times are in the State Board of Education. Um, uh, the, excuse me, they've given authority to the secretary, but at any rate, we can always, we can always uh, have a piece of that conversation. Um, other questions?
I so appreciate uh, you for coming to speak to us. Um, we are paying attention as are you in, in how we're going to be seeing out the end of this school year, but it is also raising questions um, about the coming school year. Um, there certainly are concerns that we're looking into with relation to the Ed Fund. Um, all of these things will affect you. Um, I have been very appreciative of the fact that the number of people that are coming together and working together is incredibly important and seems to be making a difference. I also want us to always keep in mind the opportunities um, going forward that we can gain from this experience. Uh, what, what, are some, what are some things that have been trying to open up that we haven't been able to get through that we might be actually able to think about now? Um, and we would really appreciate your input on that. So if there are no other questions for um, the committee members. Um, I guess I would ask, oh wait, Caleb Elder, and then we'll have Jeff. Thanks, hey, one last question here. Um, I'm just curious, open questions to anyone. For the rest of the operating year through June 30th, um, are any of your districts in any kind of, are you waiting on any revenues basically in order to pay your bills for the rest of the current operating year? Just, just wondering if that's a factor before July 1st. Uh, I'll start. I, I understand from some things we were hearing from the state that the April 30th payment will be going out from the state. Uh, so we're feeling okay right now for the for the remainder of the year that uh, finances will be fine with that state at, uh, at the April 30th date. Anybody else on that? And just so you know that we will be looking at uh, the conversation starting between the House and the Senate in, uh, in relation to the 18 districts that currently do not have a budget. Um, we will be working with Jeff Francis and Sue from BSBA, as well as the agency and our own um, joint fiscal office to figure out how we might uh, address this to deal with the fact that you don't have budgets and the current statute is probably not that helpful. Um, so with that, I oh, think, yes, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, we, we do have one town that seems to have difficulty um, sending uh, payment. And so, you know, as, as Zach mentioned earlier, that has me even more concerned, um, you know, for, for our budget for next year, you know. Um, it's the, it seems quite dire, the future financial situation. We are aware. <laughs> And I, our Ways and Means Committee is taking a pretty good look at that as well. And we've been uh, joining with them on some of their conversations. Okay, I thank you so much. Um, Jeff Francis. Hello everyone, thank, thank you very much. Um, I asked for five minutes, I'll take two. The um, first thing I wanted to say was yesterday, BSA sponsored a webinar uh, featuring Mark for All, the goal of which was to start to bring local school officials um, uh, into the discussion around the fiscal challenges we face. Mark did a great job. Um, we want to contextualize for local leaders um, the challenges ahead using the same information that legislators are getting. We had 190 people on the call, and we're not, we will continue to do that. Um, along those lines, what I have been um, making an appeal around is this. The, we're dealing in a period of un, unprecedented challenge. Um, conventional methods are not going to serve us well. Um, I know that there are discussions going on both in the administration, in both bodies in the General Assembly, and locally with regard to the fiscal challenges. Um, my strong urging is that the General Assembly and the administration find a way to bring local school officials and educators, including the NEA, to the table sooner 
um, rather than later. So as the picture becomes clearer around what we face fiscally, um, I'm asking that we, we come together, understand the problem collectively, and work together to address what I think will be um, an extremely formidable challenge on the funding front. The reason that I say this to the Education Committee is because I think you, um, better than any other committee in the building, understand local school operations and can understand why we would want to be involved with finding solutions to these challenges. It will not work if the administration or either the House or Senate or committees therein start to float ideas about how we're going to contend with this. People are, um, are, they are weary. They are working very hard. Some are growing impatient. And it'll be great if we work together in a spirit of collegiality. Um, the third thing, uh, Chair Webb, you alluded to, and that is the 18 districts. Um, Zach McLaughlin's with you from Springfield. He's one of those 18 districts. He talked about the challenges that his school district will face. These 18 districts do not have budgets through any choice of their own. In the case of nine, their budget was defeated, and they have not had an opportunity to take a revised budget back to the electorate. In the case of the other nine, they had votes scheduled that they had not taken place yet. Um, it's a different scenario than the districts that um, pass their budgets on town meeting day. We are going to work with them and with you to get them into stable financial footing for the start of the next fiscal year with an understanding that it's gonna be tough uh, sledding for all from July 1 period. So when we had these conversations preliminarily in the Senate, in the Senate Education Committee in particular, um, the sentiment was, well, if we can help them by giving them fiscal year 20 authority to contend with FY21, that should be sufficient. Sue Siglowski and I met with 13 superintendents who serve these 18 districts the day before yesterday and they justifiably said that won't be sufficient because in effect it starts them off with a budget cut for FY 2021. We're not asking for any special dispensation for these districts. We just wanna put them on um, even footing so that they can move forward with all other districts into the challenge of the head. Um, they did not, um, control the fact that it's difficult for the electorate to even impossible for the electorate to come together right now to vote on a budget, nor do they control the economic fate of the state and the dire picture that some folks um, would be being asked to consider a budget within. So our goal is to get them through legislative authority, um, reasonable budget to start FY21 so that they can be with all other districts as we navigate these tough roads ahead. So that's what I wanted to say to you. I know there's more work to do on this, but I didn't want the moment to pass with about, without conveying those thoughts. Thank you. I believe that the bill that the Senate is working on right now has an inflator in it. Well, there are two. So there was one that was officially under discussion on Tuesday that had an inflator in it. That was discussed in the Senate Frankly, they didn't like the inflator, but I don't think we had a chance to express enough um, the perspective of these local school districts. Um, uh, Jim Demaray, who may be on the call, was asked to draft one without the inflator. That has not been formally presented yet, but he had shared that with Sue Saglowski. So we knew that that was consistent with the discussion in the Senate Education Committee. I think we'll probably talk about this next week. We may be asked why we're speaking about a bill that hadn't been formally presented yet, um, but Sue did have a copy of it. It was shared with her. And we're in a place where we frankly don't have a lot of time. Um, so we're gonna move ahead as openly um, as we possibly can uh, in that spirit of working together and getting the job done. The Senate and I uh, plan to have uh, agreement between our two committees um, before it goes to the floor. So we, we're gonna be working as well and uh, we will definitely want your, uh, your, your response and the VSBA and, and the NEA, those are critical to us in our formation. Thank you very so, much. Yeah. Thank, th 
Thank you all. I don't want to take any more time. Thank you. Okay, Jeff, thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much. Um, we're going to just continue to move on with the rest of our uh, agenda, which we'd love to have you stay. Do or do not, it's all good. But we're going to, uh, we, we've been using this uh, once a week to check in on what's happening in the field. So we've been speaking with, trying to bring people in as we did with you today, superintendents. We brought in some teachers, um, but we wanted to hear from the superintendents, from the teachers, from the school boards, from the uh, special ed uh, directors, um, from the principals. So, so I'm gonna just open up that discussion now and, and move on to Sue. So if you wanna stay and listen, I please do. <laughs> So oh, Sue Sagoski for the VSBA. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for having me. Oh, so I wanted- I'm gonna just interrupt you one, one second, I'm sorry. To the superintendents, if you have written testimony, would you send it to Avery? Um, we would appreciate that. I know that I'm gonna to wanna to be referring back to some of the things that you said. So if you have that testimony and could send it to Avery, that would be great. Thank you. Okay, excuse me, Sue, go ahead. That's fine. Thanks. Uh, I just wanted to start out by letting you know that the VSBA um, met this week, the board, on Wednesday night, and it was their first uh, fully remote board meeting. We normally uh, meet in person with the option for people to participate through GoToMeeting, but this was, of course, fully remote. And um, at the end of the meeting, they, they all... Uh, expressed their profound gratitude to everyone in the education community for the heroic efforts that they're taking right now. And they sort of started out um, listing different um, people that work, different groups of people that work in the education um, community. And then they just said, you know, we really can't do that because we're gonna miss somebody. We just really appreciate all of them. So I wanted to, um, convey that to you um, and to the people that are listening. Um, also let you know that the webinar that Jeff talked about that uh, happened yesterday with Mark Peralt, there were uh, school board chairs on that webinar. All the school board chairs in the state were invited to participate. And uh, we will be emailing a link to the recording of it to all the school board members um, in, the, in Vermont so that they all have access to that information. It's really important um, that, that they're hearing the same information that you are hearing um, from the Joint Fiscal Office. I'll touch briefly on the uh, 18 districts without budgets. Uh, that's a, a topic that the BSBA board covered on Wednesday night. And after, um, being briefed on um, everything that, uh, that Jeff spoke about uh, already in his uh, testimony, the VSBA board um, voted to support an approach that would um, provide spending authority for F FY 2021 at uh, a, the level of FY 2020 plus an inflator. And um, also when the, as part of that vote, um, supported an extended amount of time for getting um, budgets approved by voters because of this um, pandemic voting cannot occur during April and May. So um, they're supporting an extended amount of time for districts to get their budgets approved. Um, would also just say uh, similarly to what uh, Jeff stated that the interest is really in seeing that all Vermont school districts are as prepared to move into FY 2021 as possible and um, on, on um, equal footing. I guess the last thing I'd let you know about is that we're working on getting um, resources out to our new board members. This is quite a time to come on as a brand new school board member. Uh, there's certainly a lot to learn for anyone who comes on as a new school board member, but during this time, uh, I'm, it's really, quite overwhelming. So we're especially working on getting um, the new school board members all of the resources they need in order to um, be effective board members. That concludes my comments. Thank you.
I believe that the draft 1.1 1 .1, um, of the Senate draft is the one that you're talking about, which I believe is going to be um, put into a committee bill once they go through the formal process of allowing uh, our, our bodies to, to develop committee bills beyond the, the deadline. Um, yes, you're correct, it's 1.1. 1 .1. Yeah. Who's not going to like this? Well, I'm not sure who's, I mean, I, I think that uh, it's a pretty compelling argument to say that they, you want to put them on equal footing with the other districts that have already passed budgets. Um, I know that there are um, districts, there are a few districts that have a, a significant increase in the number of pupils. And um, so their, their budgets are, are um, going up more significantly. Um, and that's just because of the increase in the number of pupils that they have. Um, so they, it, it may be that they would like to see uh, some kind of factor um, applied in that, um, in that bill that would take that into account. Questions? Uh, Peter, come. Yeah, I think my question is along the lines of what you were just talking about with the um, increased number of pupils. I know at least one of the districts that hasn't voted is a non-operating district, no schools. So, you know, their their budget is just simply numbers of students times um, expected tuition rates. And it seems like uh, those should be sort of moved to the side given a very specific formula since theirs is essentially pure math. Um, and, and I guess I, I wonder if, if there are how many of, of those without budgets are, are not operating. Uh, I don't know the answer to that question, but I could certainly find it out for you and let you okay. know. It's, yeah, not important now, thank you. Um, so is there any value in waiting. We had heard at one point that it might be a problem. We don't want to preempt towns from voting. I'm wondering your thought on that. I think um, I think the sentiment um, that I heard on Wednesday night was that there should be an extension of the, I mean, normally um, boards can vote on a budget as many times as it takes them to pass a budget. Um, and I think the, the sentiment that I heard was that there should be um, time beyond June 30th for boards to present budgets to their communities and have them voted on um, before the default uh, budget would be basically imposed upon them. Was there, I don't remember, was there a date in the um, Senate bill around that? Or, or that's something we can discuss. We'll be taking this up next week. The committee will be taking this, this up next week. I'm looking at it right now. Um, in, in draft 1.1, 1 .1, it says if the fiscal year 21, 2021 budget of a school district has not been approved by voters on or before June 30th. Okay. And that date was not, um, that, that date was not necessarily acceptable. I think it needs to be extended beyond June 30th. Okay. Um, Dylan, did you have a question? Yeah, thanks Sue. I mean, as a representative in a community that has not yet uh, voted for a budget, um, I don't know uh, quite how best to respond to it because part of my concern is, um, the seeds of fiscal chaos are sown by forces not of our own making, right? This is a genuine crisis. And so I have some concerns about not necessarily our community, but any community that hasn't advanced a budget, their ability to do so in this environment, particularly if you have uh, voters who are really on hard times, who might be very concerned about uh, fiscal impacts. We can all relate to that. So I'm just trying to understand it, but I'd be very supportive 
um, just given the, the realities we're facing here and many other communities are, I'd be very supportive to either figure out, is there an inflator we could put on a default budget that would bring districts up to a, a point where they have ability to build around next year or looking specifically at what you're saying more time. So I just, I wanna let the committee know this is something I think I could be supportive of um, and would be interested as we get going, Sue, to just hear as this uh, evolves with your members, what you think would be best um, so that we can reach consensus here. Yeah, I'd be happy to uh, ask some school board chairs to, if they'd like to testify to your committee um, so you could hear directly from them. The draft 1.1 does have an inflator in it equal to the average statewide increase in ed spending for already approved budgets. Um, Kathleen, James? Yep, um, just to make sure I'm understanding, there is not yet any wording for a solution for um, the districts you mentioned, mentioned, Sue, that have an unexpected increase in student enrollment? Right, uh, that, that is not reflected in draft 1.1 right now. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Sue. We will be, um, Avery, we're going to be working on um, this bill as well as 173. There are going to be two different bills. We'll be working on those next week. So we'll get those lined up. Okay, um, thank you. Okay, so the next is Jay Nichols. Jay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So for the record, uh, Jay Nichols, Executive Director of the BPA, I've got maybe five minutes or so of testimony. Thanks for having me. I want to start by expressing my sympathy to all the committee members who knew uh, Bernie Jeskovich and especially Larry on the news of Bernie's passing. You're in my thoughts and prayers, Larry, and everybody else. Uh, on April 6, uh, we participated in a two-hour Zoom call with high school principals, assistant principals, and other school-level high school leaders around the state. We had 45 people on the call. And additionally, we had a meeting with our VPA's Equity Practitioner Network, which is made up of principals and other school leaders focused on equity issues in our schools, talking about the impact of COVID-19 virus on equity. The high school agenda centered mostly around grading and instruction and equity issues. So here are a few themes from that, from that conversation. Principals really wanna make sure that um, no harm is done to students academically for things they can't control. And some of the things that people are doing are as follows. Some schools are moving to pass fail for the rest of the year. Others are moving to systems like high pass, pass fail, or pass with distinction, pass fail. Some schools are going A, B, or pass fail. And some are even giving students the option to take whatever method helps them the most. So different students could choose different things in some of these settings. Others are still having a GPA and traditional letter and number grades but they're not allowing students' grades or GPA to decline during the crisis. In other words, they're making sure students' grades don't go below where they were before the crisis started. That's actually something that's very common uh, and the colleges are, are doing that all across the country that I've seen. Leaders are worried that if you're grading material, are you really grading for priv uh, privilege and just increasing the learning gap? There are concerns about new learning especially and the huge equity issues related to that, new learning without actually having a teacher with you. How much new learning should students be expected to acquire is something that high school principals and teachers are struggling with. Uh, some parents are pushing back hard that they want traditional grades and assessments. Others are saying, in fact, more are saying, no, this is all way too much for us. You know, give us a break, give our kids a break here. Most principals are saying they won't be doing traditional final exams. Many are saying uh, that the assessments that are being taken at home really could be testing the resources of the family as opposed to the curriculum knowledge of the student. Some are gonna use these though as formative assessments just to see where kids are at in relationship to their learning. Some places are keeping the grading systems exactly the way they are right now, but erring on the side of the student. So again, the students uh, can't go backwards, but they could go forward if they're, if they're making progress. There are some concerns that principals shared on Monday with some teachers not adjusting uh, and trying to run their classes essentially as usual which is creating great problems for some students. And, and as you know, it can be a huge equity issue. Principals are working with teachers to understand that they can't expect their classes and curriculum coverage to proceed as it did before the crisis. And most teachers have been phenomenal about this and understand this. Um, 
There are concerns about students are not engaging. How to connect with these students is a real issue. Some students, um, some schools rather, will give incompletes to students who refuse or are unable to participate in remote learning. Uh, there's an importance of making decisions, but being willing to change them going forward. Several principals said they were going to put in a system, and if that system hurt the student in any way, they were going to revisit that system at the end of the uh, end of the school year to make sure that students were held harmless. Bottom line is uh, there also were discussions about credit recovery. What do you do if a kid does nothing and, you, and he or she is a kid who's on the margins of whether they're going to graduate or not? How do we reach those kids somehow? So a lot of discussion about that, no firm answers on that. And the bottom line is principal said at the high school level, we need to meet the kids where they are when they come back. We need to meet them where they are right now and give them as much support as we can. And that was a resounding theme on that call. Now for the Equity Practitioners Network, which is 24 principals, um, mostly are mostly elementary principals. They wanna make sure that people understand that the pace is not slowing down for administrators. Many are working longer hours than ever before. They're trying to solve problems for which there really is no solution. The stress level is very high and principals want people to know that this is also true for support staff and teachers. Teachers and support staff across the state of Vermont have been phenomenal. Uh, hats out to our teachers, hats out to their organization, uh, Vermont NEA organizations like that, and to the teachers in the field and support staff. They've been great. They had some thematic concerns that they wanted me to share with you. Some of this you've heard me say before from other groups. Online learning is not equitable because we don't have universal access to broadband or one-on-one -on -one devices. This should be provided from the state if there's any hope for equity in online education. That should be step one. Uh, worries about parents who are losing income are now being asked to manage their children's education on top of their basic survival needs as a family. The impact is wildly disproportionate for families that were already struggling with poverty, disabilities, and other forms of marginalization. A recurring theme was there should be free internet connect connectivity for everyone everywhere in the state. Uh, some big concerns about food insecurity for families as people lose jobs. Some concern about the next two weeks, vacations. Some school districts will be providing meals, some won't. So we're worried about some families during that, during that time. School leaders are worried about increased domestic violence and the safety of children at home without the physical presence of school. There was a concern about Act 166 providers um, now closing with districts now being asked to provide distance learning for the students they don't know and that others have been paid to educate previously. Principals were wondering how they're supposed to do that. However, I wanna add here that the AOE is addressing this concern. And so we're happy about that. Uh, in fact, Dan made a comment today or Heather, made a, Heather Boucher made a comment that Dan had said something along the lines of, if we don't get high quality academics for our three and four year olds, you know, for this period of time, as long as they're safe and, you know, socially and emotionally, that's what really matters. And he's absolutely right. The inequities for children with special needs is particularly apparent and troublesome. Principals are really struggling with this. These are the children that are the toughest to educate. And now we're asking parents to do much of the work for which they do not have the training or skill set. There are no easy answers. You heard superintendents talk about that. Another thing that hasn't come up too much there's uh, with the superintendents, there's concerns about planning for next year. Principals are saying, how do I hire people? How do we hire remotely? Many school systems already have many openings for next year. How do they see candidates teach when there are no students to actually see them teach in a traditional sense, which is an important part of the hiring process. Um, and, and the other thing that, was, that came up several times is we we're trying to have full school starting in a remote way on April 13th when we know it isn't really possible or even advisable. What race is it that we're trying to win and at what cost? I do have to say guidance that's come out from the AOE has been really good. We've worked with the AOE on that. Uh, several superintendents and myself were worked with Dan uh, over the course of a weekend on this. And I think it's a lot better now. There is more understanding about what kind of screen time kids should actually be expected to have. It's much more in line with national standards. And I'd like to close by sharing two, two quotes from school leaders that I found very powerful, and I think you will too. The first is from a principal who does not want to be named, who's in the Equity Practitioner Network. And she says, I am blown away and brought to tears by the fact that not once in this real life sci-fi movie have I heard an administrator, an educator, an instructional assistant, cafeteria staff, custodian, bus driver say no. I've heard how. I've seen puzzled looks and laughter in the face of seemingly impossible challenges. I've seen courage and connection and I'm alternatively lost, stressed, scared, and incredibly inspired by those I work with. And then the second quote is from Chris Young, 
principal at North Country High School and a member of our executive council, uh, Chris said the following. I think the scariest part in all of this is that we just don't know what is actually happening in our children's homes, nor do we know what the longer term impact of this closure is going to have on their mental and physical health. I think we can probably agree that it will take quite a while to remediate the academic impact, but it is the social emotional impact that keeps me up at night. We have students who rely on schools for their basic needs, including food, clean clothes, medication, personal care, and therapeutic services. We have built social service agencies within our schools to meet these basic needs. And now that schools are closed, it is likely that many of our students' basic needs are unmet. We will not even see the impact of this neglect until schools are reopened. And addressing the, the effects of that neglect will take longer than any academic recovery will. Given the scope of the school's response to the pandemic, it should be apparent that the question people should be asking isn't, why do schools cost so much? But rather, how can schools possibly deliver everything that they deliver for so little? And those are my prepared remarks for today. Thank you. Will you send those in to Avery? Yes, I will. Thank you very much. Um, let's see. Thank you. Any questions for Jay? We appreciate the passion with which you share. Um, what's happening for our kids. Passion is coming from the teachers and coming from the principals. Um, let's see, the next is, I know that the secretary is coming on at 3.30. Um, let's see if we can get uh, Tracy in. And when, when the secretary comes in, Jeff Bannon will see, um, I might ask you to wait. Oh, the secretary's here. Tracy and, and Jeff Bannon, do you mind waiting while we, uh, Listen to the secretary. Okay. Of course not. Of course you don't. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Secretary, for for joining us. We've had quite Good a afternoon. quite a day. Have you? <laughs> yeah, listening with the, listening to the superintendents. It's 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 moving. So yes. So um, you were going to speak to us about a number of things. So I'll just give you the microphone. Yeah, I think the general idea was an update. Um, I can say the, um, you know, I'm sure you're aware the governor announced uh, an extension of this emergency, um, state of emergency and the stay at home, uh, stay safe uh, approach through May 15. Uh, that's still, uh, they want me to stay on target with the May 8th deadline relative to uh, producing some guidance on end of year celebrations. Uh, and or graduation. So we're starting that conversation now. Um, I had a conversation earlier today with other stakeholders. So we're gonna start percolating some ideas on that. The, uh, certainly the, the primary um, aspect of that decision-making will be the public health information, um, but that, that guidance will still be on trajectory for uh, honor before May 8th. The, uh, we have no new information on CARES Act uh, dissemination of funds, but I will say the you know, certainly a better part of my week now has been focused on the financial situation. Uh, so we're spending a lot of time on that uh, with other legislative leaders, um, folks inside the agency and in the finance office. So um, I expect to, uh, you know, next week that to be a major focus of our work. Um, just a lot of, you know, trying to wrap our arms around the problem and uh, start to identify some solutions and possible strategies we could use. The um, continuity of learning plans are coming back. We had asked those to come back on Wednesday of this week and uh, our staff uh, read through a good chunk of them last night. Um, we seem to be, um, the reaction is very positive about what districts are doing in terms of uh, trying to meet those requirements. But, you know, as you know, everything we're doing now is uncharted territory. So um, we're, our disposition is to be su as supportive as opposed to regular, from a regulatory standpoint, we're just trying to uh, help districts iron out some issues and identify folks uh, that could be supportive to that work. Um, working with other uh, agency heads and particularly Department of Public Service, um, Agency of Commerce Community Development and uh, Agency of Digital Services on broadband issues. Um, that work falls into a couple buckets. One is just sort of uh, 
trying to triage and troubleshoot individual, literally individual parents and teacher addresses to see what we can do working with private providers to get uh, resources out to folks. Um, on another level, we'll be applying for a, a new round of um, rural telemedicine distance learning grants that just came out uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture. So we'll be uh, submitting a grant proposal for that on infra broadband infrastructure issues. Um, but we're just trying to, uh, I guess, on a couple levels, work on the broadband issue. And I think, you know, as you know, that'll be one of the outcomes probably of this crisis is that will be a more emphatic policy emphasis on broadband needs in the state. Um, I think that's, I, I mean, I can talk about other, other aspects of the work, but, um, from a regulatory standpoint, it's once we turn the corner on the continuity of learning, that's been sort of, I think, a place of stability to a certain extent. So now we're just working on en enacting that work and, and trying to, um, support the needs of our students, um, and the teachers as best we can. Uh, the finance piece is a big piece that's out there right now, I think. I would, I would agree. We heard a little bit from the superintendents about some of the, 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 the work that they're doing to try to expand broadband. And I, I did not hear that they were getting help from the state. Are you, are, is the state trying to help with this right now? It sounded like they were, they were finding avenues on their own. Um, yeah, I think all of the above, you know, it's one of those things where you know, certainly districts will have some flexibility inside their CARES Act money to pay for things uh, along those lines. But my impression is most of what everyone's working on is our sort of what I call last mile issues. You know, we're trying to really resolve individual parent and student access problems. Uh, I, I haven't heard much about like sort of the broader infrastructure issues. Do they have wide area networks and so forth? Because most of what we're dealing with is outside of the school. Uh, perimeter, you know, it's really out into the broader landscape. So we did, uh, we sent out a survey at the end of last week, uh, trying to connect uh, the school community with uh, the public service community. So, you know, we were asked folks to identify families and students that might need access. Um, but that that didn't work well. Uh, I think it's just people don't have a lot of bandwidth to do surveys right now. And uh, so uh, we were just chatting earlier today, what we're gonna try to do is stand that up at the state level. So if you're an individual parent or a teacher who doesn't have access or any Vermonter, we're just gonna encourage them to submit a form um, and we'll go from there and just sort of cut out the middleman, so to speak, on getting that data. Um, the advantage on that end is we work directly with the providers a lot more than the districts necessarily do. Though there's some good partnerships that say Rutland City had a great, uh, Representative Cooley is probably familiar with that. They had, you know, a nice partnership with uh, providers, um, school district and so forth. But, you know, everything's going on. Districts are working directly with folks. We're working with folks. Uh, it's all hands on deck, so to speak. Um. I definitely have a few questions. One, we also heard, we just heard from Jay uh, Nichols about, about grading. The grading, I guess, totally is, is a local control, I, I gather, or are you providing guidance on that? Yeah, our guidance is it's a local control issue, but I think, you know, no, to the, to the point, our guidance is really, and this is where I think it's really important to get everyone on the same sheet of music and you know, that uh, what's going on now is not the same thing as taking in-person instruction and just shoehorning it into remote learning, you know. So we have to sort of, uh, I won't say lower people's expectations, but take some of that pressure off. You know, everyone initially was uh, really trying to just do what they did in person online or by delivering materials and so forth. And it's just not possible. Um, so I think what we're seeing so far is folks are coming up with uh, an appropriate response relative to academic uh, accountability and grading and so forth. Uh, we just put out some guidance today on uh, sort of graduation, which is sort of in that general theme as well. It's like look for flexible ways to document student learning. Don't be so insistent on some of the traditional methodologies because we're going to have to we're going to have to solve this problem here, and it's going to require uh, some flexibility. And I think. Therefore, most appro appropriately, uh, uh, locals need to have the maximum flexibility to figure that out. Um, before I open it up to, uh, I'm going to have three things that I'm going to want to talk about. One is budget, one is 173, and one is the thing that came to us from the colleges. But before we get to that, I wanted to just see if there were questions from um, members. And I see Caleb Elder with a question. 
Thank you, and thank you, Secretary, uh, for joining us again. Um, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is just uh, uh, following up on a question I asked you last time we heard from you, which was um, it, it, since that time, I think that we've heard the health commissioner say that we're going to be moving towards more surveillance testing in some cases um, as school uh, staff are still working. And of course, the school delivery, uh, food delivery systems are so critical. I'm just wondering if you've heard anything about as that testing capacity becomes more available, if we could see widespread testing in our school staff. That's question number one. And I will just say question number two uh, as well here. Um, Basically, when we hear about the budget shortfalls, uh, we did just hear from some superintendents, it sounded like the April 30th payments were going out. And so revenues for this current operating year are, are pretty secure. I'm just curious if, we, if you know at any point during the coming operating year, which starts July 1st, when we might anticipate that, um, could there be instances in which school districts don't receive anticipated revenues due to funding shortfalls? Um, so, sorry for two big questions, but there they are. <laughs> yeah, no, I think um, on the first question, we don't have any specific formulation of extending PPE requirements or testing requirements to school food service personnel, though I would, I would suggest that might be a possibility as we ramp up uh, those measures for all folks that are on the front lines of dealing with the emergency. Um, I, my observation is that we've, we continue to expand our testing capacity fairly aggressively. Um, we're one of the leaders every time I see us ranked on, from a state basis, we're seen to be near the top of that. And the information uh, that I'm seeing about, um, you know, on the other side of this, uh, when we start to try to, uh, let's say, as the governor uses the phrase, open the spigot and, and try to go back to normalcy to a certain extent, you know, our ability to do that pre having a vaccine is going to be predicated on our ability to do greater surveillance and having uh, more significant PP available for everyone. So I think that's coming, uh, but there's no specific strategy right now that I'm aware of on food service. In terms of the budget issue, um, my approach on this has been initially to talk about fiscal year 20 versus fiscal year 21. Uh, it's not clear to me yet what the nature of the problem is in fiscal year 20. I, I have pieces of information. Um, but we're endeavoring to sort of articulate a problem statement, if you will, very succinctly. Uh, so when you mentioned cash flow payments on April 30th, it's still not clear to me how that's going to work and if, if there is a problem there or not. So we're just trying to wrap our arms around this and get a solid problem definition. I think by next week, we'll, we'll have a better understanding of that. But it's really requiring a composite view of lots of folks. I know Representative Conwin was on a uh, testimony that I was in the other day. Um, I think it was in Senate finance <clears throat> and or might have been in uh, Ways and Means where, you know, Bill Talbot was there, you know, Brad James has been in JFO. So we're all we're all trying to pull this together and understand the true uh, nature of the problem firstly, then identify strategies. So I think if if that logic holds up, you know, where we look at fiscal year 20, for an immediate, if, you, if we have something that needs to be addressed immediately, we need to work fairly aggressively to do that. It's not clear to me yet if that's the case or not relative to the education fund. Um, but certainly fiscal year 21 is a whole other can of worms. And I think, you know, my, my message to the superintendents on Wednesday is, you know, you know uh, don't, don't expect business as usual. I think, you know, one of the, you know, significant impacts of the virus will certainly be on the state's economy and, and how we, uh, and the state's uh, financing of education is an important part of that. So uh, what I hope to do is certainly get information out as early as we can so folks are informed about their context. But um, yeah, we're going to, we're going to have, uh, you know, to be making some difficult decisions. I think it's also hard at this point to understand uh, the amount or timing of any federal revenue that will be coming into school districts as, you know, as it will be coming into states as a whole. So maybe some of these problems aren't as significant as we might think if there's some stability introduced from the federal revenues, but all that's sort of open, up in the air. Um, but, uh, you know, at the moment, uh, we have many school districts, all but 18 essentially, that have adopted school budgets. So we know, you know, what that sort of projected spending is going to be. Uh, we've supported some language that was sponsored, I think, originally, or the idea was sponsored by VSA about how to deal with those 18. 
um, just to once again, trying to bring some stability into the immediate context. But we'll, as soon as we can sort of address the immediate issue in fiscal year 20, uh, in the next couple of weeks, it will turn our efforts into the fiscal year 21 issues. But I think to a large extent between now and June 30, hopefully we'll have a better understanding of certainly where the virus is gonna be, where's, you know, if the economy is gonna come back online, um, and then also to start to understand to what extent we'll have federal dollars coming in to support some of these systems. But I still expect, even with all that, that the impact's going to be pretty significant, um, and we'll start we'll start working on fiscal year twenty one stuff almost immediately. Peter Conlon. Uh, thanks. Uh, just curious to know if the agency is or will be providing districts with some guidance on financial decisions such as furloughing employees. Yeah, that's uh, we haven't done specific guidance on that issue, but um, I've said to folks, I, I think this is when, when this is all said and done, our financial guidance will be probably the largest body of guidance that we produce. Uh, we've already produced a significant amount of guidance uh, on, on coding of information and so forth and, and how to manage uh, various aspects of um, federal grants and so forth. The, uh, the issue of uh, furloughing employees, I mean, right now, you know, as you know, we're making this transition from the maintenance of learning to sort of the continuity of learning. There is a, a thread that's common through, throughout this uh, emergency, which is that districts are required to pay their employees uh, their current employees, you know, so anyone who's, uh, whether it's a paraeducator or a teacher, districts are required to continue to pay them, whether uh, those folks are actually performing their assigned duties or working their regular schedule, and they are required to pay them in accordance with their regular scheduled hours. That was decided early on in the process as an economic stability strategy. Um, but as we turn the corner, particularly on uh, contractual services, we're already starting to get questions from districts on non-employee compensation. So if you're obligated for a service uh, and that service is no longer being delivered, to what extent are you required to continue to pay those, make those payments in particular, if those payments are subject or allowed a cost for reimbursement under some federal grant or special education. So. We have a lot of those questions coming up. So we are, I told superintendents that we will be producing guidance on that contractual issue. Um, but the issue around employees, at least through the length of this current emergency at the end of the year is that uh, you are to pay people um, as, as if they were working their regular scheduled hours. And on the other hand, districts still have the full um, obligation to live under any collective bargaining agreements or other contracts they might have with staff. Um, so if in many cases, in the case of furloughing or, or reduction in force, we've long since passed or since passed the deadline by which many districts could actually uh, work under that, their collective bargaining agreements to do any kind of reduction in force. So um, I think, you know, for the moment, we're not providing any guidance on that issue, um, other than to say we have, they have a directive to continue to employ all staff, but we are going to be producing some guidance on the contract uh, issue. Um, we had a, a, a situation that came up. We, we're hearing that um, the funding for busing, since they're not not busing students, they're busing um, food. <laughs> uh, that there's not a reimbursement for that. Does that go through the Ed Fund, or is that transportation, or what's the story with that? Yeah, I mean, there's. I think I, I raised the question to folks. Um, it's an area we. You know, we were uh, sort of we were talking about um, are there statutory things we might want to look at. Um, I just sort of posited that my understanding of the statutory language under transportation reimbursement is that that's exclusive to transporting students to and from school each day. So districts uh, are required at the end of the year to submit uh, a tally of their uh, their proposed allowable costs, if you will, for transportation. Mm -hmm. And part of that definition is that it can't be for anything else other than transportation to and from schools. So they, they're not, for instance, allowed to include trips for away games or field trips. That's not part of the reimbursement scheme that we have in the state. So uh, the question would be, is that what we mean by student transportation costs or not? Um, or is it going to fall into that bucket of uh, costs that are COVID-19 related and therefore 
they'll have other revenues available to pay for that, you know? So it's essentially, um, I would say in the case of uh, the transportation fund and or the, the way we approach transportation reimbursement, generally that reimbursement somewhere around 45%, um, you know, for qualified transportation to and from school. On the other hand, uh, delivering meals with a school bus might not qualify as the current statutory definition is, but on the other hand, those costs are totally allowable under their federal CARES Act money, and it might be a cost they pick up on that side at 100% reimbursement. So the, 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 the transportation fund, I don't think, is struggling quite as much as the general fund and the education fund. Is it worth? Well, when I said transportation fund, it's not, I'd have to go back and look. I don't know if we, I don't think we have a discrete fund per se for school transportation. When I said transportation fund, you're thinking of the larger infrastructure mm -hmm. transportation fund, state highways and so forth. Uh, the school transportation amount uh, is, is sort of pegged off an inflator of inflation and so forth. So that percentage, I, I quoted 45%. That number moves uh, depending on how much cost there is and the inflation of the total amount the state's going to provide for transportation. But as you know, not every school district in the state provides transportation, or some do it for some grades and not for others. So uh, the question would be, you know, is there? I don't think. I guess is what I'm saying. I don't think there's a need to address the statutory language on this because I think there's adequate flexibility through CARES Act funding. This is exactly the type of expense that's clearly COVID-19 related that should be uh, qualified and coded as a COVID-19 expense, and therefore, hopefully, CARES Act revenue would pick up the difference. As uh, you move forward with guidance, um, I did speak with a, a mental health counselor uh, regarding the concern for our, our children who are at risk. And our conversation went to the, to the fact that, um, you know, COVID-19 is, you know, we, we, we are doing what we're doing. It's a primary health issue and we are responding to a primary health issue. Um, children, from what we know so far, are tend to be at a lower risk. In contrast, they are at risk for a secondary health issue, which is mental health. Um, so with children not being in school, the chances of, of mental health uh, changes is something that I, I'm really hoping, as you look at, at continuity of learning guidance, are, are taking into account um, the incredible challenges that we are likely to see related to children returning to school with um, mental health changes. No, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's everyone's anticipating that. We did issue joint guidance with the Department of Health just separately this recently this week on uh, acknowledging that this issue is on our radar and that we're also encouraging districts to maintain their uh, contracts with their designated service agencies and uh, also to make them aware that there's virtual therapeutic in interventions and support mechanisms available. Those services have been transitioned to being online. Um, but we, uh, similar to our childcare uh, perspective, we need, uh, we need that mental health infrastructure available to us now and certainly after the crisis is over. So uh, we felt it would be uh, helpful uh, to produce joint guidance on that. And we did so this week, uh, just to raise the awareness to everyone. Um, compensatory ed is another one on my mind. <laughs> I'm assuming it's on yours as well. Absolutely. Um, anything happening yet around that? Nothing new on that. Um, you know, we, uh, the general, as predicted, sort of OSEP, you know, the federal um, Department of Education's section that deals with special education um, has, has been very uh, good in their guidance, but they're also uh, still closely adhering to the requirements of that law and not interested in uh, backing away from our commitment to our most vulnerable students as, as a state. We aren't interested in doing that either. Uh, so, um, you know, right now, folks are being very uh, uh, creative, shall we say, in implementing uh, strategies. Part of that work, um, it was first necessary, I think, to define what we mean by the regular education environment in terms of continuity of learning. So I think the next logical phase of that is to then 
uh, revisit uh, student supports around that. Um, and certainly uh, another area where I think federal funding will be helpful with the CARES Act is that um, our disabled students are going to, our students with disabilities are going to need additional supports during this period and afterwards. And um, districts should prioritize uh, the use of their CARES money in that regard uh, to ensure these students are supported. But yeah, it's, it's going to be a significant challenge. And, uh, and as you mentioned, compensatory services, that challenge isn't going to go away uh, when we all return to normal per se, because we're, we're going to have to uh, assess uh, the impact of this crisis on all our students, including uh, the impact on those students with disabilities. Um, I'm not seeing any questions, so I, I just want to say that um, we are going to be working on some default budget language. Language We're going to want to be in touch with the agency um, and, uh, you know, some access to, to Brad as well uh, as to what the impact will be on whatever legislation that we're looking into. I know the Senate is going to be starting a bill. We're going to be coordinating that language so that whatever we we finally move forward uh it, there'll be we will all be happy with it and both committees will be able to support it and uh we are going to be looking for your support in whatever it is we do as well so i want you to be involved um i've asked jfo to to also look at what the impact is basically on our districts and on the the, the ed fund the other thing we're looking at is um, 173 delay that will also start in the Senate um, and uh, we'll be following that. So we're going to want your your uh, feedback on that. Um, and I assume we'll be doing that with Emily. Yeah, I mean, we uh, testified, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to keep track of the time, but I believe it was uh, earlier this week that Emily and I were testifying in Senate education and uh, we've produced the language on 173 delay, um, basically a one year delay across the board. Uh, we also have the technical corrections language from last year that's still a live issue. Mm -hmm. um, we did, we introduced that concept. Uh, that was our, that was my opinion and our, the agency's disposition. Uh, we did put a caveat on, caveat on that in that we hadn't had a chance due to the time to consult with either the census-based advisory group or the state board on that. So I've, I've had other conversations with the state board chair since then, and uh, they're moving forward uh, uh, with their um, rulemaking process on 173. Um, but the board as a whole will will discuss uh, some more. Their next meeting is April 22nd, so we'll have some perspective from the state board. And Megan's been made aware of our testimony. So we, we've produced testimony on 173 delay. We've also drafted testimony, I think Jim has seen, on uh, dealing with the 18 school districts. Um, so we've done that as well. But yeah, if you need anything, just let us know. And Emily's, Emily would be happy to help. There's one more thing that came up this morning from our uh, colleges, our state colleges, university, and independent colleges. Um, they are looking for, and I believe may have reached out to the governor, looking for immunity for colleges who are, are used, to, you know, their, their campuses are available. Um, they're worried about liability, and I oh. think we're seeking something from the, 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 the governor uh, to give them some immunity um, from liability related to this, and wondering if, if um, you're aware of if there's any action on that. Uh, I was unaware. I'm unaware of this issue. It's not something necessarily that would go through me, uh, but um, you know, I appreciate putting on my radar. I'm happy to coordinate with them on that, but I, I have, this is the first time I've heard of it. So. Yeah, I mean, it certainly makes some sense, and it's whether whether the governor can do it by executive order or we need to do something about it. Um, um, okay. Certainly seems like a reasonable request. Um, anybody else have anything? I guess what I would say in closing is um, in this time, the incredible importance of uh, working together and keeping in touch with the various experts in education and experts in children and the providers and the state and the legislature and the administration is going to be what we're gonna to need to be able to get through this. I agree. Yeah, no mavericks. <laughs> Um, 
so I think we are good. Let me just make sure that I'm Um, okay, Kathleen, did you have a question? I'm just having trouble reading my, my messages here. Oh, she might have. Kathleen, did you have a question? Uh, nope, no questions. And I, I don't think my little hand is raised. So I, no, I'm I good. don't think it is either. Okay. Um, thank you very much. We are going to move on then to hear from um, the teachers and from the special ed administrators. Go Have ahead. a good weekend. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Wait, so how much time do you have? I want to be as... Well, it says I have two minutes, but can we can we all I'll go? Be really brief, because I want to give Jeff a chance to say something. Yeah. I did yeah. actually. So again, I'm Tracy Sawyers, Executive Director of Vermont Council of Special Ed Administrators. And thanks once again for having me here. Um, I did provide written testimony, so I won't go through this, but I really appreciate people taking a look at that because I wanted to talk to you about two things, which was the Disability Law Project's letter from, I think, April 3rd um, around the CARES Act. And um, I feel like it's important, um, you know, to see kind of our response um, and thinking on that. Um, and then I was gonna talk to you more about the independent school special ed piece that we talked about last time, but you can look in my testimony to kind of see where we are on that issue and then we can just check back in. Um, I guess I would just mainly say that, um, you know, we've as we've told you, Erin McGuire, all of us, you're hearing from school personnel, you know, the ability to meet timelines and formal compliance requirements of IDEA is, a significant challenge at this time and any flexibility we've been asking for um, through our national organization or um, the Good Work AOE has been great working with us um, is just limited flexibilities only in the specific circumstance of COVID-19. This is not an attempt to repeal rights, um, but instead just enable family flexibility with an emphasis on local education agencies and parents making good faith efforts in light of the current circumstances. Um, we have many families who don't even want to have IEP meetings or do evaluations right now um, under the circumstances and we just don't want the procedural part of IDEA um, to put them in an untenable situation. Um, so in my testimony, it talks uh, a little more specifically um, about what's in place and some of the things that we're asking for, but it's, it's very limited um, and it's just what needs to happen, we feel, believe, for, for families um, and for um, the schools as well. Um, some of the things in the Disability Law Project um, letter um, really point to kind of um, expanding the IED mandate. Um, and in this emergency, it's just impossible um, and it's it's inappropriate. So we completely um, are very much um, concerned with families and children, but we're really just trying to figure out how best we can work with them where they are um, in moving forward. So if you could just, yeah, look at those pieces um, that I have in the testimony. Um, and our request would just be to um, not block access um, to, to federal relief if it comes. Um, as I think, again, it, families need a break from some of the procedural parts of IDEA as well as um, now as well. And um, we are hopeful that some of those very limited flexibilities will come forward um, from the federal government. So we're still waiting. Um, but I talked about the letter that we had sent with our national organization um, last week. And so um, again, there's more in my testimony. So I think um, that was the most important part um, of that piece. Um, and just quickly with regard to the um, guidance for approved independent schools, including residential facilities that we looked at um, last week. I hadn't, you know, we had just seen that um, that day, but we interpret it to say that LEAs will continue to pay tuition and will be reimbursed. And again, I can't stress enough, you know, how these schools are such a critical um, part of what we do and we don't want them to fail. Um, we're just, um, Right now, we're just LEAs are needing clarity about whether the state will continue to reimburse the LEAs at the same rate as they were being reimbursed prior to the pandemic, or if they would limit the reimbursement for actual costs of services delivered. Um, 
So, you know, the, the reality is special education schools may or may not be able to continue the services and regardless, the services are going to look different and they're going to be provided for less hours. So we're working with the AOE um, and looking at federal guidance and continuing to figure out um, this kind of financial piece of this. Um, so, um, you know, I think at this point, what that says, and we've heard is you continue to pay the special education only independent schools. and. We'll just have to see how that plays out um, in the coming weeks, both at the AOE level and, and with more guidance that comes out federally. So um, I wanted to close the loop on that. And I think, um, again, if you read my testimony, I'll, I'll stop. <laughs> and, and we'll be following up with you on 173 later. Yes, and we do support, um, we do support the delay. Um, I had a board meeting this morning. Um, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have you do it later because I wanna make sure I give Jeff Fannin and I know we're gonna have you back on that. Thank you. Okay. So I don't see any questions for you right now, Tracy, but I'm sure we will once we get to, to and, and we also have mental health coming in next week to talk with us about um, how kids are doing. Oh, Sarita, you had a question. Question: um, Can we get copies uh, can, of the testimony of the delay, the 173 delay that Dan French talked about, and also this testimony, uh, Tracy's testimony? Can we get copies of that? That'll be on our website. It will. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay. So Jeff Fannin. All right. Teachers come last. Uh, huh? <laughs> good afternoon. <clears throat> I won't take being last as a uh, as a symbol of anything other than uh, I stand between you and a weekend on Good Friday, no less. Um, so uh, happy Easter, happy Good Friday, happy Passover, Ramadan at the end of the month, and anything else you're celebrating. Ha happy to all. Um, I'm going to start where uh, I think it was Jay started, and just acknowledge what what's all going on here. We're in a in the middle of a health crisis. And to put a fine point on it, uh, we did lose uh, a good person in the form of Representative uh, Bernie Jenkowitz and, and uh, acknowledging Larry, a good friend of yours. And, and I last saw Larry uh, Bernie in the airport, I think in January, he looked tanned and rested and we chatted and met his wife. He looked great. And I, I, I remarked to him that he looked great. And, and he just said, yeah, he felt great. He looked great. It was a nice conversation with wow. his wife and his son. And, and uh, he just looked really happy. Uh, and so it's, that's my fond memory of, of Bernie now is uh, happy in the airport. Uh, so anyway, and that's why we're here. That's why we're all here on a Friday on a Zoom is that <clears throat> we, uh, we're, we're in the middle of a health crisis. It's not an education crisis. It's not a, a, it's turning into an education crisis. It's turning into a fiscal crisis, but it truly is a health crisis. That's why we are here. And so, um, I just want to bring us back to that and, and uh, a little bit. So, and the reason we're, we close schools to kids is that uh, we want to keep them safe and healthy and their families safe and healthy. And so that's what we're, that's priority number one. And that's what we're all trying to do and doing a great job at doing it. We should give ourselves a pat on the back. It's been one month, uh, truly, and uh, we're making it uh, day by day. And some days are longer and harder than others, but um, we are doing it. So applause to us all. Um, but we are starting to think, and Vermont A and, and others have mentioned this here, we're starting to think ahead about next year and how we get kids back into school. Uh, it is not going to be easy. It's not going to be a regular start of the school year. Uh, and and um, one of the things we are doing is working with the uh, Northeast Family Institute, NFI, to put together a PD program, a professional development program for educators, uh, a webinar, I should say. Um, to address the social and emotional needs and trauma sensitive practices that we're going to need with that we will need to employ next year, if not sooner. And so uh, this is for the well being of the educators, they need they need that training and reinforcement. But also these are different times and they need new, new and different strategies to deal with that as they welcome their kids back next year. So um, it is not going to be easy, but we're trying to pivot to that and make sure that people have the education uh, that they they so desperately need uh, to, to get up to speed. Uh, the stress levels of educators is off the chart and, and that includes superintendents, principals. I've seen emails from administrators that, uh, you know, where they, they acknowledge themselves that they're beleaguered and, and challenged. And, and my, 
you know, the teachers and, and educators I work with, it's the chart is the uh, stress is off the charts in some cases. Uh, and it's as well for their students and their families. It, it's, it's across the board. <clears throat> and uh, those, there will be some consequences as a result. And I'm just going to, you know, I've been, we've been collecting stories from our members and I just got one during the, during this hearing. And I won't read you the six pages of different educators who are responding, reporting about their families, their students, their own families and their own students, their own children who are students as well. Um, and I'll just read you one quick one. I won't identify the person. I don't have permission yet, but um, they've been teaching for 14 years. They've cried about students before. They've worried about their safety, worried about them being fed. Uh, they've worried about them being loved and, were, and brought worries. And she's brought home, worries home with her about those kids. But she was always able to separate home and work. And, the, and she said there was a definite line. And she said, there is no line anymore. It's COVID-19 has decimated that line. Um, and so that's, it's, it's spilling over into her personal life, her kids' lives. Um, and that's true around the state. And it's not a, a sob story, it's just an observation. And it's simply a fact uh, that we're all gonna have to deal with down the road. Um, one way this is playing out is the CLPs, the Con Continuity of Learning Plans. So the, I think the AOEs received, uh, we met with Dan French earlier today. I think he said they've had, uh, they've received 25 CLPs from around the state. They're due, I think, Monday. Um, so those are all coming in. That was as of yesterday. Uh, <clears throat> and our concern about that, the CLPs and the development of those was that a lot of cases, teachers weren't involved in the development. So we're asking administrators to develop these plans for continuity of learning. And we wanted to make sure that teachers had a voice. So in some cases, they, they had great voice. In some places, not so much. And we're trying to work through that uh, and get some guidance from the agency to make sure that educators are involved in that process because they are, in fact, the ones uh, delivering the education. Uh, and we'll work through that. Um, I think that's about all I really have to say and answer any questions you have. But happy to come back and talk more about 173. Uh, it's a big issue. and. Um, uh, internet access remains a, a significant challenge for a lot of the same families. Those that have, have, and those that have not continue not to have in so many ways. And internet just being one example of that. So happy to answer any questions. Well aware of the fiscal challenges that we're staring down. And I think uh, Secretary French is right. Uh, looking, I think what he said is looking ahead more towards 21 than 20. Uh, and trying to figure out next week what the federal government will do. They're issuing guidelines, gui guidance next week on the CARES Act. And then there's a 30-day application period thereafter. So it, it's some time before the money from the CARES Act will actually hit the streets here in Vermont. So um, anyway, happy to answer any questions uh, you might have late on a Friday. I'm not seeing any. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yes, I am. Sarita Austin. Hi, Jeff. Hello, Sarita. How Hi. are you? Good. And this is kind of just maybe just from a school counselor perspective. We spent like in my in my school an enormous amount of time from March on creating groupings for the next year. <clears throat> so sixth grade all the sixth grade teachers got together to create balanced groupings. So the receiving teachers, you know, in terms of special educators, stu educate, SPED students, you know, special ed students uh, in need of special education, ELL, different academic levels. So each group that a teacher received was balanced. How is, but I'm trying to figure out how is that occurring the next year? I mean, there are, I mean, I can't imagine the combinations of kids that are going to a middle school or a high school or, you know, just how is that going to occur? I, I, well, the answer is, I don't know. i be very blunt with you. I know that it is uh, something that needs to occur. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I, I, I have not heard any discussion of it. I imagine that the guidance uh, folks are starting to look at it. You know, originally it was the first few weeks of just in crisis, full on crisis yeah. mode. And I think people are starting to shift into, OK, this is this is going to go on for some time. Schools will reopen uh, at some point. And when they do, how's that going to look? And, you know, what are the grades going to look like? 
uh, everybody will be a little bit behind. And that's mm -hmm. true in Vermont and it's true nationally. So, you know, when, when I hear parents that are stressing about my kids missing in this assignment or this algebra or something, every kid in the country is doing the same thing, is struggling the same way. They're all, you know, missing these last two months of school. So I think that we just need to give our, ourselves a break and and uh, and allow for that. So the answer to your question, though, one thing in New Hampshire, for example, they, um, the associations, uh, the NEA New Hampshire and the superintendents over there, the principals, school boards, put together a joint statement and they were recommending a four day school day, school week, followed by a one day planning. And it would, that, I'm not saying that we should do that uh, necessarily, but it's, it's one option and that fourth day be a planning day for teachers and guidance to figure out next year and the next yeah. week, usually. So it might be- To me, it's a big equity issue. Yeah, it's, it's part of the, the equity issue, certainly. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Avery, we've got a tentative start on a schedule for next Thank you week. all. Thank you so much, Jeff. Um, and if there's a time we can get some teachers in, we'll just see, maybe not, maybe not now. I think probably we'll hear from mental health and then we'll all realize that we really all need a mental health counselor. I know I'm ready to sign up. <laughs> um, just thinking about those kids, I tell you. Hard. So, um, Avery, we've got Tuesday right now. So, I think <clears throat> we're, we're done. We're, we're done. I